as a puppy owner, you've probably noticed that there are lots of little training challenges that come up along the way. And one very common training challenge is the teenage phase. Now, the good news is that this happens to nearly every puppy, so you're not in a unique position. But the bad news is, if you don't know how to train through this situation, you can really set your training back. In today's video, we're gonna hear from Kale and instructor Meg about Meg's one-year-old puppy named Highlight. They're gonna talk about the fact that there are actually two points in your puppy's life where training naturally gets a little bit more challenging. By the end of this video, you're going to be able to identify what some of these challenges are, how to plan for them, and most importantly, how to train through them. I'm Ken Steep, and welcome back to McCann Dogs. Here at McCann Dogs, we've helped more than 100,000 dog owners to overcome the same dog training challenges that you have. So if this is your first time on the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button so that I can help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. The teenage phase is a real thing and there's a couple times in your dog's life that they're probably gonna go through it. Sometimes around four months, next around seven months. And um, today we're gonna be talking with uh, Meg. She's one of our head instructors and our online trainers here. And she actually has a young Border Collie about 11 months old. And uh, we're gonna talk about a few examples um, that you went through with her around that those two particular phases, what she did, how you dealt with it, and what our viewers at home can do to stop it with their dogs. Now you guys might remember Highlight as a puppy because we actually, I borrowed her several times to use in our, our videos and uh, she was such a great little puppy. She was eager to work. I had her around maybe 10 or 11 weeks old and she was just happy to do whatever I wanted. Um, very much for Meg as well. And then when she probably turned about four or five months, you started to do a little bit more with her. Mm -hmm. And uh, what kinds of things did you notice different about her at that age versus like when she was a baby, baby puppy? Yep. So the biggest thing things would be uh, when she was really young it was generally just she and I and the amount of stimulation the amount of motion uh, even just uh, keeping the environments calm uh, everything was easier I generally trained at my home or in low distraction environments and then all of a sudden I noticed and it was a great thing this is one of the things I love about her uh, she started to notice things more and liked it so she noticed other people she noticed other dogs uh, she got very confident in new situations but that actually made it uh, more difficult for training because she wanted to seek out all of those things instead of just thinking that I was the most exciting thing in her world. Yeah, I think it's really common for that to happen with everybody's um, puppy. And a common thing that people will do is they, they get kind of swept away with the, with the puppy's eagerness. And then we do things like let our puppies pull us towards other dogs, or we let our puppies do this, and we let our puppies do that because we think, oh, look at how bold they are, this is great. And then what happens is we kind of start to develop or allow the puppy to start rehearsing behaviors that we don't actually want when they're older. We don't want, you know, a four month old puppy is very different than a three year old dog that's still exhibiting those same behaviors. So what kind of things did you notice her doing and um, what did you do to work with through them? Yeah, so for her, uh, absolutely motion was the biggest distraction. Uh, she thought anything that moved uh, was what she needed to be involved with. So uh, when I first brought her to class, when she was around five months or so, I noticed that uh, she really lacked focus as any of the other dogs in class were moving. And what I tried to do is make sure uh, even with those new distractions that I was still able to rein her in, to bring her back to me. So I made a lot of choices that some of our students wouldn't even think to make. Uh, when I was in class, I chose to sit at the very end so that I wasn't surrounded by other dogs. I probably brought five or six different types of treats and I also knew that food wasn't really her favorite thing so I always brought a toy to class as well. So I always tried to set myself up for success so I had her number one reinforcer. Yeah, and those types of tactics can also be applied for when you take your puppy to a new scenario. Maybe you're taking them to the park for the first time, or you're taking them to a friend's house or whatever you're doing. When you go to that new location, consider how many um, difficult challenges that you might be applying to your puppy at, at once. Are they around new people, environment? How much freedom are you giving them? Are they on leash? Are they off leash? Um, so it's really important to set them up for success. She knew she was in a busy environment, something that was new, so she was armed with a lot of reinforcements that she knew is going to help the dog to make good choices. So think about how to set your puppy up um, for success and then make sure that you're ready to change things should you need to. So if going to the park at the busiest times a day when like there's kids running around and there's dogs running around, that might not be the best time to be going to do your training sessions. Maybe pick a quieter time, maybe go a little bit further away, bring your high value food so that you can start to build on success rather than allowing the puppy to learn from the beginning to make poor choices. So basically you need to anticipate the problems and then be ready to 
to attack them. Now, what's really important for you to know is that everybody goes through these adolescent phases with her puppy. Four months, seven months, you know, Meg's a professional dog trainer. She's made some fantastic choices with her dog, but she still went through little periods of time where she had to evaluate the, the situation and make some different choices for your puppy. And you're gonna need to do exactly the same. Now, we talked a little bit about four months, but we're also gonna talk about kind of the more challenging one. And that's when puppies hit around seven months. There's that threshold where the puppy's starting to be less baby puppy and more more into, you know, getting towards to be an adult dog. And the tougher part about this is that you may have had, you know, a string of months where things have gone really successfully. And now what the puppies are gonna do is deliberately test you. Even though they might know how to make better uh, choices, they might start to test the limits a little bit more. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what that uh, period looks like and what you can do to get through it successfully. She is coming yeah. up to a year old, yep. so she has been in and out and may go in again. Huh. A bit of a teenage phase. So what's some of the things that you notice the most Good. about her when oh she God. got into that sort of that, uh, yeah. that adolescent testy phase? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for her is that she's exceptionally friendly, if you oh, couldn't really? tell already. Oh, really? didn't notice that. Uh, and that's actually with uh, people and dogs. And that's one of the things I love the most about her, but I know that that's going to become one of my training challenges yep. as well. Uh, she has probably started hiking with my boy uh, probably around the time she was seven or eight months uh, because up until that point everything was pretty much done with her on her own mm -hmm. and it started out fabulously she was great everything was wonderful she was listening I did have a long line on her for the first little bit and then it seemed as though every time I called her response to name come command she was turning on a dime every single time and I got a little overconfident and I took the line off completely and all of a sudden she hit this phase and um, Next thing you know, I would call her and in the middle of the trail, I'll never forget this, she literally looked at me, looked back, saw the boys running and gave me a peace out mom and oh, ran down the so trail and she blew me off and it was probably the first time ever this puppy's had the opportunity to be wrong. She'd been right so many times, I actually thought that she didn't know that ignoring her name was an option, but apparently she did. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she did that one other time with a squirrel in the backyard. and. At that point, I could have let that go on and on and on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then it probably would have become a big problem. Mm -hmm. Instead, the line went back on, and uh, I actually trained her for a little bit with just my old dog that's a little bit less exciting. Yep. He doesn't move as fast, he doesn't uh, act as silly. And when I saw that she was able to respond beautifully around Swift, at 13, then I started including a different dog. And then finally now she's reintegrated back in the pack. Mm -hmm. The three of them can hike together no problem. And uh, her responses are right back to, to dynamite. Here, Lou. Yeah. Good girl. Um, one of the things Good that Meg girl. said that uh, seems very normal to us as dog trainers, but is actually quite yeah. unique, is she didn't actually have her dog hiking and running and playing and walking with her older dogs until the dog was like eight months old. So that's, that's seven months or five months really of just continuous stuff between the puppy and Meg, which is why initially when she started to um, integrate the dogs together, the puppy was making great choices because that's kind of all she ever knew. Um, and then sometimes what happens is it's smooth sailing for a little bit and then the puppy starts to go, wait a second, there's other dogs here. Mm -hmm. Wait a second, there's squirrels. And then they start to make poor choices. And this is what, like what Meg said, this is where a lot of people go wrong. They let those poor choices happen over and over again. And now all that like great stuff that happened for a while, well, now it's gone because we've allowed the dog to seek reinforcement in other areas. So um, there's a good lesson here, and that is once you see a glimmer of a problem, we need to dial it back, get the long line back on, get back to some of our training so that things don't end up getting worse. So we talked about uh, the recall and some outdoor control um, and how you sort of work through that. But what about things like in terms of like being in the house? You have a you know young kid, probably lots going on in the house with adolescent dog. What are some of the things that you struggled with? And of course, how did you work through those things to make sure that she was making good choices? Yeah. The biggest thing that I noticed was that she was um, first in a crate a lot more when she was younger, and then I generally start giving my dogs more and more time loose in the house. Uh, however, I still have expectations that they don't get to run wild. That's just not something you get to do. And one of the things I found was that when my son was running around playing, she could handle it if it was situations that were a little less exciting. So for example, she worked a lot at lying on a dog bed, for example, while he and I were working on some puzzles. Uh, maybe he was doing some art at the table. Um, maybe we were just sitting there reading a book. Things that were 
were a little bit less exciting. Uh, if he was bombing around my house with a cape on and yelling at the top of his lungs, being a typical three-year-old boy, <laughs> uh, which does happen at my house, uh, then I found in those situations, she did struggle to make the right choice to either remain on a bed or remain calm uh, and, and not choose to chase after him and uh, join in all the fun. So Meg's example of the kids and dogs is certainly something I'm sure a lot of you can relate to, but uh, maybe your teenage phase is, you know, resulting in other behaviors that are not going so well at home. Like, you know, maybe having accidents in the house again or chewing your things, your shoes, you name it. Um, actually, you have a story about um, your brother's dog that uh, just recently came up. Yeah, absolutely. He uh, was complaining to me the other day. He's been off uh, due to COVID and working from home for the longest time for months. And he started to give his husky more and more freedom around the house, mainly because he was there a lot of the time and he was able to watch him. All of a sudden now, uh, he's gone back to work and that dog who had a lot more freedom and he thought he was able to handle that freedom has since proved that he can't. And uh, he came home one day from work and the dog had actually chewed uh, the baseboards while he was at work. Uh, I think he was chewing some of the shoes in the front hall closet oh boy. Uh, that were actually in the front hallway, maybe not put in the closet. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, they did discover then that this husky had to get put back in the crate again and he mm -hmm. hasn't been in the crate in months. But unfortunately for his safety and for the, the safety of their home, they've had to reestablish some new rules and some new routines again. I think it's also important to remember yeah. that, um, you know, sometimes people think like, oh gosh, I have to put my dog back in the crate and I'm like backtracking in my training, but that's not really how, what you have to think about. I think that there's going to be lots of phases in, in your dog's life where you're going to give them a little bit of freedom, things are going to go well, and then they're going to make a mistake and then you're going to need to take that freedom away and then offer it again in a little bit. And you might end up doing some back and forth and back and forth until, you know, you can't really remember the last time they picked up shoes when they're not supposed to or you can't remember the last time they had an accident in the house that tells you that they're ready for some of that freedom but I think far too uh, people are too eager to give their young dogs freedom and opportunity and then you end up getting more mistakes rather than having them earn the freedom in the first place or they give too much too fast yes so we hear often about students that uh, for the first time ever they left their dog and they left them for an eight-hour yes. period of time yes. instead of typically what we would do is okay I'm gonna try leaving my dog they haven't ever chewed anything they haven't had an accident in the house in a long time why don't I leave them loose while I go have a shower mm -hmm. why don't I leave them loose while I go down the street to go get the mail we do shorter increments of time and we build up to that yeah. instead of throwing them a huge chunk of time where they can get really creative with what they do while and we're then gone. being like well I hope they're okay yeah I hope I, I have a do. coach when I get home <laughs> yeah absolutely definitely being able to make better choices like that is important and then being able to take away the freedom which is not a fun thing to do but um, just like kids you sometimes have to dial things back and um, offer it once again once you feel that that they're making better choices so another common one that we hear often from our online students uh, is about a dog that's been given a little bit more freedom in the house. Things like going up on couches, mm -hmm. going up on beds, sometimes without permission, or sometimes then once they're up there, the owners have a difficult time getting them off again mm -hmm. and uh, aren't really sure how to deal with that because it's the first time the dog thinks that uh, they get to call the shots on uh, on some of these sort of uh, gifts around the house. Absolutely. And I think sometimes adolescents, they are more naturally curious. Maybe they're taller and they can see what's up there now <laughs> a little bit more. Um, but I think it's also common for them to be like, oh, well, I wasn't really allowed to do this when I was four months, but how about when I'm seven months? Mm -hmm. Like, do the rules still apply? So working through those things is really important um, for, um, Issues like that specifically, jumping on the bed, jumping on the couch, maybe counter surfing, jumping up to see what's on the counter. One of the things that we really recommend that people do is go back to having a leash or line on the dog in the house because those um, particular behaviors, among others, are very self-rewarding behaviors, which means if you're not there to catch them in the act of doing it, um, they will repeat it over and over and over again, especially if they get to get up and have like a nice snuggly nap on the couch or they get to get up and steal a loaf of bread and down it while you're not paying attention so having a leash on is going to be really really important with that obviously is going to come um, supervision um, in a busy household um, I know when we have lots of stuff going on there's like certain things that we use in the house to like make supervision easier um, what are some of the things
things that you do in your house to like make your life easier so you don't have to watch the dog all of the time for sure um my son's room is a hot topic right now uh <laughs> it's uh generally a bit of like a bomb went off uh in his playroom so often uh the playroom and his bedroom i close those doors sometimes because i don't want to see what's in there uh <laughs> but also because there is a lot more temptations there than any other room mm -hmm. and i find that if i'm downstairs i want to know uh that there's no chance she's getting up on his bed to see what his stuffed animals taste like mm -hmm. uh, i don't think she would do any of those things but i don't want to give her the opportunity to find out mm -hmm. so i restrict access to a whole floor of my house yep. i basically close all the bedroom doors so sure she might run up the stairs and see what's up there she's going to find an empty hallway and she'll generally zip yep. right back down when she was a baby puppy i just put a baby gate at the bottom of the stairs i didn't even let her go up and down the stairs at all mm -hmm. yeah we do somewhere we use a lot of baby gates we have a crate in a really central area in our house so that if the puppy is being crated or the young dog is being crated and there's stuff going on in the home they don't feel like they're being banished to the bedroom or banished to the basement they're still you know with the family and seeing things going on, um, but they're in a controlled environment. Baby gates are super helpful, lines are super helpful, and leashes. So if they happen to grab something, the worst thing you can do is like chase after the dog and the dog starts to learn like a big catch me if you can type of game, which means you better believe they're gonna do it again. So being able to stop those things quickly and efficiently without getting angry, without raising your voice, without chasing the dog, are all gonna be ways to show leadership in a little bit more of a common assertive way. And then of course you can redirect the dog to better choices but the goal is to um, adapt your house and adapt your structure so that they're not getting into trouble and then you're saying no don't do that and then they try this and you're saying no don't do that your day should not be made up with a bunch of no no no's it should be more like wow, what a great choice. Look, you offered to go lay on your bed or you're sitting calmly. Um, you said something great earlier about um, training the dog around like the couches and the beds and like rather than waiting for them to make a mistake, like what would you do differently? Yeah, absolutely. And actually I was just helping one of our online students with this the other day. Uh, the puppy uh, was jumping on uh, the couch every time they got an opportunity to go through the living room. Uh, and what we were actually working through was having the line on and at first literally just walking past the couch. And every time the puppy looked at the couch and chose not to jump up there on their own, we praised them and rewarded them. And then next we redirected them to a more appropriate place. So we then redirected the puppy uh, with that line just dragging on the ground over to the dog bed at which point a Kong was given or the next time a bone was given and I actually said keep a little a uh, little Tupperware or something close by to that bed yeah. so every time your puppy chooses to make that choice they're then further reinforced for it yeah basically you're taking the reinforcement which originally was naturally from the dog's perspective jumping up on the couch and we're basically saying that's actually not rewarding going and lying on the bed is rewarding that's where all the reinforcement are dogs in general always do things that they find rewarding and so if you're not there to like stop some of those not fun things for us uh, things like jumping on the couch if you're not there to stop those things your dog will just naturally find them rewarding so the training that we do needs to shift the narrative and needs to teach our dogs that making other choices that they might not think of themselves well by reinforcing them a lot for them the dogs will tend to gravitate to making those better choices which means going back to what I said before you're spending more time saying wow puppy what a great choice and less time <laughs> ripping your hair out and being frustrated with your teenage bratty dog. Good leadership can help speed you through this adolescent phase. If you want to learn more about how to be a great leader for your puppy, check out that card right there. If you have an adolescent dog at home and you want a little bit more guidance on what to do, you can actually work with Meg and I online in our life skills program. The link is in the description below. And on that note, I'm Kale. I'm Meg. This is Highlight. Happy, Happy training. training.